All right, so we'll just start with setting our motivation. So if you want to get yourself into a contemplative headspace, we'll go ahead and start. Sange churan sogi churanam noe janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi churan gi pe sonam ki drola penji sange jupa sho sange churan sogi churanam la janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi churan gi pe sonam ki I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Okay. So um, we're going to start with White Tara Meditation. So I know we haven't talked about white Tara very much, but we will. Let's uh, start with a short, just really gentle white Tara meditation and then talk about her a little bit. And then we might have time to do a slightly different one at the end, um, depending on your questions. So if you want to get yourself a good meditation posture, we'll just dig right into it. Nice straight back. A few deep intentional breaths, getting yourself to settle. And so we'll start this very short white Tara meditation. Start by just reconnecting with refuge in bodhicitta in your heart. We've just said it out loud. Now repeat it in your mind. What am I taking refuge in? What am I taking refuge from? To what aim and how? Let yourself engage with the prayer for a moment. And however much you're able to touch refuge in bodhicitta, make sure you really deeply think I'm doing this practice not just for myself, but in order to benefit all sentient beings. May these positive practices have a ripple effect. And then visualize white Tara above your head or in front of you at the level of your forehead. Just take a moment and imagine her very present here. And you can choose whether she goes in front or goes above your crown. She's radiant white made of transparent light seated in the vajra posture one face two arms six eyes embodying health and vitality, the speller of sickness, 
illnesses, both mental and physical, environmental, situational. and visualize long life nectar coming from Tara's heart. This blissful white nectar enters your crown and completely fills your body. Feel strongly and concentrate clearly that all your sicknesses, spirit harms, negative karmas and obscurations are completely purified. and holding that visualization at the mantra. Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punya Jana Pushtum Kuruye Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punya Jana Pushtum Kuruye Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mama Ayo Punyan Jana Pushtum Kuri Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mama Ayo Punyan Jana Pushtum Kuri Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mama Ayo Punyan Jana Pushtum Kuri Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mama Ayo Punyan Jana Pushtum Kuri Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mama Ayo Punyan Jana Pushtum Kuri Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mama Ayo Punyan Jana Pushtum Kuri Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mama Ayo Punye Jana Pushtum Kuru Yesoha. And continue the mantra under your breath, together with the visualization. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Mama Ayo Punye Jana Pushtum Kuru Yesoha.
Om tare tutare ture mama aya punya jana pushtam kuri ye soha. So feel strongly that your life has been increased, your merit developed, your scriptural understanding and wisdom increased, and that you've achieved the realization of immortality. Tara dissolves into light and absorbs into you, stabilizing those blessings and that healing. and dedicate the merit to achieve the state of Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. And you can relax your attention. Okay. So there is a lot of white Tara practices that you can do. The Kind of the next one up is actually quite extensive and quite long and it has layers of visualization layers of mantra and it's fairly elaborate for a kriya tantra practice and that's why tara wish fulfilling wheel and that one is really beautiful so if you have the white tara empowerment i really recommend downloading that one because it's really beautiful and it's got all these wonderful layers of protection so I thought I would just give you a short rundown of White Tara and then just see what comes up, see what questions you have or what ideas develop. So here we go. We're on chapter four still. And the section about White Tara specifically is fairly short. And it's basically because it's variations on a theme. So Rinpoche says, White Tara resembles green Tara in most aspects. Besides, of course, that her color is white, symbolizing having overcome the two obscurations. So the two obscurations are the obscurations of knowledge. Those, those knowledge obscurations are sometimes called obscurations to omniscience. And then also the obscurations of afflictions or afflictive obscurations. So those are removed quite a long, you know, quite a ways down the path when we were talking about the five paths. Those are removed on the path of meditation. Then she has seven eyes, the third eye on her face in the middle of her forehead, and one on each of her palms and on the soles of her feet. The, these symbolize her realizations of the three doors of liberation, emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness, and the realization of the four immeasurable thoughts, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. Unlike Green Tara, who has her right leg extended, White Tara sits in the full Bhadra posture. So if you're not familiar with that framing of the three doors of liberation, the footnote really helps. So there are many interpretations of these three words and this framing of the three doors of liberation will come about in all sorts of different Buddhist schools. But the common one is that emptiness refers to the lack of inherent nature. Signlessness is the lack of inherent cause. And wishlessness is the lack of inherent production. So nothing has an inherent nature. Everything's nature is dependently arisen. Nothing has an inherent cause. All causes are dependently arisen. And there is no inherently produced thing. All production, all causation, everything is dependently arisen. So it's just three different angles, variations of a theme, and these three doors of liberation are an interesting teaching. So if you're ever looking for an interesting emptiness talk, um, emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness is a nice one to dig into. But her first three eyes, her regular eyes and her third eye, those are the three doors of liberation. She's realized those. And then the two on her hands and the two on her feet, these are the four immeasurable thoughts. So the four immeasurable thoughts are also pervasive teachings that you'll find in all schools of Buddhism, but what they're emphasizing and what they're directing to will vary. Um, they can also relate to the four jhanic states. So these four will keep popping up again and again, but even as a basic secular idea, their importance is pretty obvious, I think. So she's related to long life deities, right? White Tara is one of the long life deities. The other two in our tradition we see a lot are Amitayas and Namgyalma. 
So this is from Rinpoche. He says, although we all have a certain lifespan determined by the karma created in previous lives, that lifespan can be cut short through the ripening of negative imprints caused by having committed a heavy negative action motivated by self-cherishing or one of the other delusions. So this creates an obstacle to our life, which can result in death. We would call that untimely death. Reciting the mantra of White Tara is especially effective for eliminating life obstacles, helping us to have a long life. It's also a powerful healing mantra. However, as I've mentioned, if the motivation is only for relief from this temporal suffering and to enjoy this life's pleasures, the recitation does not become virtuous, even though it may help alleviate immediate problems. Along with the practices of Nam Gelma and others that help us to have a long life, White Tara practice is considered very effective when we liberate animals. So prolonging the lives of the animals by saving their lives naturally prolongs our own life. So these three, Namgelma, Amitayas, White Tara, these are our three main long life deities. And all of their mantras are very good also at the time of death to help um, create powerful conditions for yourself or whoever is the dying person or dying animal to connect with their previously created positive karma to have a positive rebirth. So these are wonderful practices uh, to have in your life. So her mantra is basically the same as the green Tara mantra. It just has a few extra syllables. So Om Tare to Tare Ture is the same. Then we have Mama Arya Punye Jana Pushtim Kuru Soha. And those extra syllables are making it what's called an increase mantra, and it's increasing life, merit, and wisdom. And at the center is the seed syllable Tam in the practices that describe the seed syllable. So the longer versions of the practice will say the seed syllable Tam, often where Tara arises from. So meditational deities such as Tara each have their own particular seed syllable, a single sound that expresses their essence. For all forms of Tara, the seed syllable is Tam, so pronounced Tam like with more aspiration. These syllables written as a single letter or stack of letters in Tibetan are viewed as representations of the deity and as living expressions of the wisdom and energy of the divine that the deity transmits. So as David Schneider states in his excellent article, Sacred Seeds, just as the seed of a plant contains the whole plant, so a seed syllable concentrates everything characteristic of an enlightened energy. He goes on to say, letters were seen as an intermediary step between the ineffable majesty of the divine and more elaborated rituals. The divine rustled itself into form, first through sound and then letter, only later taking iconographical shape and story. Thus the seed syllable Tom contains the entire essence of Tara, her wisdom, her compassion, her protection from all fears and dangers, and her enlightened activities, all condensed and available to you through the sound or image of Tom. So, Om Tari Tu Tari Ture, we talked about in depth a couple days ago or last week. Um, the mama means myself. So to increase your own lifespan, merit and wisdom, yourself. But if you're doing it for your teacher, instead of mama, you say guru. So Om Tari Tu Tari Ture Guru, Arya Punyanjana Pushtum Kuru Soha. Arya is lifespan, Punye is merit, Jana is wisdom, Pushtum is to increase, Kuru Soha, may this come about. Okay, so this kind of brings us to an interesting idea of wishing for our teachers to have long life or requesting our teachers to have long life. This is a concept that gets shown in a lot of different areas and a lot of sadhanas. Even just the seven limb prayer, there's a request to stay and a request to teach. And you might think, don't the gurus already want to stay? Don't they already want to teach? Why are we asking them to do what they're already up to? Um, why would we pray for the long life of our teachers? How can we have any influence on that? And also, if they could choose to live long, wouldn't they just do that? Why do they need us to ask? These are the sort of questions that might arise, I'm guessing. Um, 
so part of these things of the request to stay or the request to teach or the request for the Lama to have a long life is about you, it's not about them. It's about you creating the cause to see them, you creating the cause to experience teachings. So it's said that the Buddhas will remain in human form teaching us as long as we continue to request them to do so. So we need to request them to do so, <laughs> okay? So it kind of follows along with this whole not being missionaries, not prophetizing vibe that we have in Buddhism. But I think there's something very engaging, very empowering about thinking, if I want a teaching, I need to ask for it. If I want the holy beings to be in my face, to be in my life, to be present for me, I need to say so. I have to speak up. There's something really interesting about the psychology of that. Because when you're saying, I want this, please may this be, you become immediately receptive and engaged in a much different way than if you're kind of passively walking along, decide to go to a teaching randomly, sit in the back, passively with your arms crossed, this may or may not apply to me, it's a general talk, passively leave before it's even done, you know, and just kind of like, is it entertaining or not? That's my criteria for staying, you know, when you're sort of passive about the spiritual path, it can't go in. But if you thought, I've requested this teaching, you lean into it much differently. And when you think I'm continuously requesting teachings and I'm continuously requesting the teacher to stay, again, there's an engagement and a dynamic that's established that's a lot more powerful. So from a karmic perspective, you're creating the cause. Yeah. But in terms of the psychology of it, it immediately opens you up and makes you a much better student, right? A student and a practitioner, a lot more engaged. So these prayers should never be lip service and these practices don't get weird and think oh i haven't been asking my teacher to live long and that's why he's dying like don't get weird okay don't get like superstitious um you know they're gonna show the aspect of a certain lifespan and they're probably not gonna get into a kind of lazarus sort of nagajuna situation where they're gonna live for 400 years because that's gonna weird people out and the news crews will come and it'll make it too much chaos to study dharma so our teachers are probably not gonna live more than 100 years but we want them to live as long as they possibly can because when they die even when we find them again we have to wait for them to grow up it takes ages right? So annoying. So, you know, the little ones, they come out with some amazing goods, but still it's like, you know, 10, 20 years. So we want them to last a long time in this form that we've engaged with. And so we keep making requests. There's a lot of things that create the cause for the Lama to show the aspect of long life. One is to ask, one is to do white Tara practices. Another is to just keep the promises that you've made. Yeah, if you've made promises to your teachers, keep them. It is like a continuous way of building the momentum between you and the connection between you. So they're never going to leave you. It's just that you, by you not keeping your promises, it's like you're leaving them. Yeah, they're never leaving you, but you're kind of leaving them. The tether gets frayed, kind of energetically speaking. It's never a lost cause. Don't get heavy about it. But really do feel like I need to keep reaching back for the connection to be strong. Does it make sense? Yeah. So you can do this practice for yourself. You can do this practice for your Lama to show the aspect of long life. A lot of long life pujas have white Tara as their basis or Namgyalma as their basis, or just like it's Guru Puja with a bunch of mantras related to long life deities. That's more common in our tradition. So you'll see these kinds of things a lot, but you can also use white Tara for your friends and family who are unwell. So particularly people that you have a strong karmic connection with, you're a strong condition for. So if you're linking to white Tara and then linking to them, it's like you're linking them to white Tara in a much stronger way than if some monks and nuns in Nepal are praying for them, but they haven't ever met them and they don't have the same karmic connection with them. Still has benefit because they're directing their attention that way, but because you have a strong connection, it might wind up being very powerful. Yeah, so the strength of your karmic connection, of course, the strength of yourself as a practitioner, your, you know, 
repeated practice adds depth, all these things play a part. But even if you don't practice white Tara very often and you know someone is really unwell, doing this for them can sometimes be a really huge benefit. They still need to have created the cause themselves, but it's like you're bringing the water and the sunshine. Does that make sense? So a lot of this is tricky karma things because whenever you're thinking I'm praying for someone, it brings up all of our old baggage or it makes it sound like the teachings on karma are suddenly put aside because we learn when we learn about karma that karma is individual and you can't transfer <laughs> karma. You can't take anyone's karma. You can't experience someone else's karma. There's, it's your own karma on this mental continuum. That's what you experience. Yep. And then suddenly you're praying for someone to have this or that happen and it feels really bizarre. So what you are is a condition, not a cause. Yeah. And then adding a practice like this makes a powerful condition. So they've made their own cause and you're just providing a condition for change. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So if they never created the cause, it doesn't really matter what we do. But because of beginningless time, it's bound, there's bound to be a seed there that you can be watering somehow for them if there's some kind of receptivity that they have, especially if you have a strong karmic connection. I think sometimes what can happen is us doing the practice. The first benefit is that we settle down and we reconnect to our refuge and we reconnect to our tantric path and that already makes better conditions for the people around us already and then by bringing in some sort of connection to the divine it elevates it but even just shamatha is going to make you a more powerful condition for the people around you you know, everything that you're doing in your practice does have an impact. You are a condition for people no matter what you do. So it's kind of choosing to be the kind of condition you want to be. Yeah. And of course, you know, the danger is getting codependent and the danger is kind of micromanaging things. And, you know, remember that karma is more subtle than emptiness. It's extremely hidden phenomena. So you do your best to be a good karmic influence while knowing there's so many other influences that you don't have control over that you want to also be having a good relaxed letting go mind at the same time yep um from the chat it says i feel that i have created the karma to not be able to see some of my teachers in person obstacles have arisen to prevent in-person teachings from happening what kind of causes could i try to purify could it be some of what you describe, like breaking vows made to the guru in past lives or something else? Yeah, definitely breaking vows to the guru would be related to not seeing them as often or as in person as you would like. Um, the Wheel of Sharp Weapons can be quite confronting to read, but it'll, it goes through a lot of those details of when this happens, it's from this. <laughs> when this happens, it's from that. And there are sutras on karma as well. But generally speaking, difficulty in accessing Dharma resources is because you have had Dharma resources in the past and put them aside and procrastinated and put them off or disrespected them or decided that they weren't important. You created distance between yourself and your Dharma supports. And so the distance continues. Even though now you're like, oh, I'm ready now. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like you've created the cause for it to be lower on the priority list. So there needs to be some purification of that. And then it might be that you get closer and closer access to the teachers and the teachings. Yeah. But I mean, just logistically too, don't be passive. You know, some people never take holidays except for Dharma holidays to go see their teachers, you know, and that's one choice a person could make, <laughs> you know, it's a choice a person could make. And pretty much all the traveling I've done in the last 20 years has been Dharma related. And then it's nice to see a cool place. But I mean, everywhere has cool places, everywhere has cool history, everywhere has cool architecture, everyone here has cool nature. Like, you know, when you've traveled enough, you're like, it's just variations on a theme, like, let's get on with it. You know, so it's also just being practical and prioritizing how you spend your money. And, um, you know, Dharma things are going to be deep and stay with you. Holiday experiences come and go, you know, so I'm kind of being strategic that way. Yes, Nate, go ahead. Well, 
you know, when he was saying, um, oh, that we can do the Waitara mantra for people that we are close to. So would I substitute the name? <clears throat> like where you said you substitute the guru's name, would I put their name in there? Some people do. Um, some people just think the mama, that word refers to that person. Okay. Um, there's a more extended version where um, you kind of place them in Amitayas's vase and the nectars go in that way. There's a lot of Amitayas with white Tara practices that go together. And um, some of that is hooking back lost vitality and then giving it to whoever you're visualizing either at your heart or Amitayas's heart, who's then at the heart of Tara. It gets very layered, but, okay. um, <laughs> lots of layers. <laughs> But um, if you're just wanting to do very simply, um, we'll do the very simple version for people who are sick um, at the end of the session. So, and that's the one that's in the chapter. It's just like a paragraph long. It's so simple, but really can be quite powerful. Okay. And the other question I was asked, wanted to ask you is, you know, when we're visualizing the nectar purifying, so I think a couple of weeks ago, you explained really clearly uh, about purifying karma, you know, using the four opponent powers. And I get that. So I'm wondering like here where, you know, we have nectar, some deities purifying us. Is that also come with an understanding of the four opponent powers? It, it depends on what you're emphasizing in the practice. So what, what the nectar and light and mantras are is the power of remedy. Yeah, they're the power of remedy. You did the power of refuge already earlier in the text. Um, so if you want to generate the power of regret briefly, or while you're visualizing, you can do it simultaneously, right? So if you're feeling like you've got enough mental space for Tara's nectar, Tara's mantra, and then the power of regret of, okay, you know, all actions of killing, all actions of, you know, resource misuse, all the things related to sickness, I'm really genuinely generating a, power, a mind of regret. Yeah. Um, and then at the end, just a very quick power of resolve before you dissolve and absorb Tara into you. So if you want it to be a full-fledged thing, add the power of regret and the power of resolve. Um, without those two, it's still very powerful. It's still a really good remedy. Yeah. It is a remedy because it, I'm, I'm, I'm reciting something wholesome because I yeah. always think like the remedy should be like me making some change in my way of thinking and habit. So I always think like, how is just visualizing nectars? I mean, it's very, very soothing, I find, but, you know, I wonder like, what is, you know, what am I actually changing about yeah. me? And that's where the power of resolve, I think, can really help you out. So when you're thinking, okay, in future, here's the change. So the remedy is just kind of clearing the energy of the habit interrupting the energy of the habit and also you know just really genuinely doing a kind of a, a, a energetic blast of all of those negative karmic seeds so if you're you know wanting to change the pattern you have to decide to change the pattern so in the power of resolve you really do have to think okay what are my habits of killing because that is why i get sick that is why i might have a shortened life what have been the ways I've been careless with life in this life? You know, like, I don't know, you went fishing as a kid or you used to shoot grasshoppers with your BB gun or, you know, pick wings off flies or put down your pets with the greatest of compassion, but still, you know, that it was not the ideal, you know, whatever killing things you've done and, and just really own it for a minute without slipping into a whole justification excuse story. Just be like, yep, that's not my path. Okay, tomorrow. When I clean the kitchen, I'm going to be careful of the ants. Just really finite, really practical, really specific. And it does start to change the tide. But you do have to be really personal and specific. And don't say, I'll never do that again if you're not sure. You know, you might say, I will never go fishing again in this life. And you can say that. But, you know, are there little habits of my life is more important that you really couldn't make a promise about? So don't. You know, don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to the Buddhas. Just gently, gently. Okay. Yeah. So taking life and misappropriation of resources are usually the causes for sickness. 
Yeah, so resources that belong to a community, to a religious community, to your family that were shared in common, but you took for granted, you know, things that you borrowed but didn't give back, and then just really obvious stealing. But everything kind of stealing adjacent, yeah, um, also can make it like your food doesn't have the life force that you want it to you know sometimes that happens you're eating good food but it doesn't have any oomph for it doesn't digest properly you know like go to the doctor but also purify you know practical and cosmic at the same time yeah yeah and and i think that um sometimes we can be lost for what did i get up to what might i have gotten up to because you're a fairly nice person staying out of trouble so, you know, reading a sutra on karma or reading the Wheel of Sharp Weapons, sometimes you can go, that sounds like something I might have done in a past life, whether I'm still doing it or not. That kind of sounds like me. I could see myself doing that. All right, let's just assume. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah uh, from the chat. Uh, I wonder if it's good to recite when eating meat. Um, yeah, Tara mantra is good if you still eat meat. Medicine Buddha mantra is good if you're still eating meat. Um, you say it a few times and then blow on the meat and think that the consciousness that is now departed but used to inhabit that meat may it have a perfect human rebirth, meet with Mahayana spiritual teachers, or be reborn in a pure land but make really positive aspirations for that animal. Um, and uh, yeah, so white Tara is good and Medicine Buddha is good. Say it a few times, blow on the meat. And, you know, with all of these habits, right, we want to just be really practical about all forms of consumption. Yeah, it's like all forms of consumption, not just food. Are we relating to it as medicine to support our practice? Or is it feeding the beast of attachment? And it's so difficult because we need food genuinely and food can be a source of attachment. So it's not like you can say, stop eating food, please don't stop eating food. And it might be that you have the kind of constitution that does need to eat meat, but do you need to eat meat as often, you know? And can you be careful about the sources and, you know, gently have less and stuff like that. But, you know, just the same with your clothes and where do they come from and your coffee, where does it come from? And, you know, just being kind of aware of consumption can help minimize the negative karma related to consuming yeah and you know don't get uptight about it but but do be intentional yeah thank you um i was just thinking about the logistics of um, not being able to get near where teachers are like everything is on for me anyway everything is online yeah you know so the karma for that that's you know that's um good karma I would imagine. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a, it's a good question. Is it good karma or bad karma? You've got the karma to meet all sorts of teachings, right? The click of a button and mm -hmm. not in person. I mean, really, it's from it's really about your perspective a lot of the time, too. Is it causing suffering? Then it's not negative karma ripening. If it's causing happiness, it's positive karma ripening. Mm. So having easy access to all of these teachings, I think, really is amazing karma ripening. You know, and the pandemic has had a lot of problems, but like that's been kind of the blessing of the pandemic, isn't it? Is that so many things have gone online. So if you're if you're really thinking in that way, then um, it helps create more of that. But it probably means in the past you've done things like um, published a lot of texts or supported people writing important Dharma texts, like you were a benefactor for someone who was writing a commentary or translating something or you were a benefactor of a Dharma center, or you, you know, just gave people rides to Dharma talks, you know, on your yak or whatever lifetime it was that you were driving, you know, you're like, oh, let's all get in the cart, you know, let's go to the Dharma class, you know, so you helped people connect with teachings, now you're having easy access to teachings. So that's, that's nice to think about that we were helpful <laughs> in the past. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, whatever wonderful things are happening in our life, think I need to keep creating the causes because you're, you know, you're reaping the benefit of your past. Are you creating the same for the future or are you just kind of draining the tank? You know, so that's a really important question for us is that whoever we were before gave us an amazing legacy. What is the Lord giving to our future self? Is it more of the same? Is it, you know, is it better or is it worse? And just really engage in that way like what am I offering to myself 
So, you know, just keep grounded and, and just think right now you've got amazing conditions. So use them well, you know, and create more of the same, but just really like, may I use them well? Cause they could also end any time. We don't know how many karmic seeds of this type we've created. I mean, you know, like I really took it for granted that I had teachings all day, every day for about seven years straight. I thought that would just be my life. And then when my teacher died, I would just go into retreat and get enlightened. Done. And, you know, so seven years straight of teachings all day, every day or retreat, it was amazing. But then suddenly my teacher got um, appointed to be the, the abbot of Yume Tantra College. And we were all like, oh, oh, crap. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. <laughs> It was a big assumption that it would be all the way, you know, until his death that we would have that. And, you know, it made me wish I had paid attention more. And it made me wish I had, you know, not taken it for granted and not wasted time with, you know, whatever, like, petty emotional issues or angst or laziness or whatever, you know, that I'd really done a deep dive at that point. And, you know, so so really make sure that you're not assuming this will be the way it always will be because things can change in a minute, you know? So, so I'm trying to, you know, nowadays trying to think of every teaching of what if this is the last time I get to be with this teacher? What if this is the last time I get to hear these things? What questions do I need to ask? What ways do I need to build depth and really be really present with it? And, you know, and I think our own suffering can help fuel our compassion for other people because when you feel separated from your teacher or separated from your community it gives you way more energy to then think all right when there is a big llama coming to town or a big retreat how can i make sure that as many people as possible who want a connection can make that connection you know mm -hmm. so so just uh, don't take anything for granted yeah Okay, so the mantra is pretty straightforward. Life, you know, life, merit, wisdom, may it increase. Yeah, life, merit, wisdom, may it increase. But there's some details that are kind of useful to look at. So these are from um, Venerable Tipton Chudron, who I think a lot of you know. She says, you can think about the meaning of that mantra while you're saying it. Side note is, but you don't have to. Um, but really feel like your lifespan is increasing. We're increasing your karmic lifespan and especially removing any kind of karma that would cause untimely death. So they say that death comes about either because the karmically given lifespan that was with us when we were born either has run out or we have untimely karma that ripens or we just run out of merit. So you know, we have a certain amount of lifespan that is projected at our birth, you know, the seed that launched this life, lots of seeds for untimely death, you know, be hit by a bus, get an illness, whatever, you can purify those to live out your full lifespan. But there's also other ways you can run out of merit, like if you spend years and years of your life boiling with hatred, that burns so much merit that you, it might result in an untimely death. So there's different things that can make you have a shortened lifespan than you would have otherwise. So then punye is increasing our merit. So not just the merit to have long life, because that's just this lifetime. The reason we want a long life, by the way, isn't just because we don't want to die. It's because we want to practice the Dharma. So everybody doesn't want to die, but we should have a better motivation than that. It's for our Dharma practice. So punye means increasing our merit, because to gain realizations, we need a lot of merit. Then jhana is wisdom the collection of merit, the collection of wisdom specifically. We need both of those. Then pushtam, may it increase. So you can contemplate that these three are increasing. So whenever you're doing long life practice, if you can think the point of the long life is to practice the Dharma. You know, you have a certain momentum, you have a certain amount of knowledge, you have a certain practice in this life. And when you die, say, all everything comes together really beautifully and you get another perfect human rebirth it's going to take a while for you to warm up again even if you meet with amazing conditions so what you want is your practice to be so solid that it's very easy for you to pick up where you left off in your next life and to not kind of backslide too much or at all you know so 
a long life means more time to do the practices that you've learned in this life. It's not that living a long time is good in and of itself, right? It's in order to practice. So if you're thinking about your practice right now, if you were to die right now and then you were reborn and you grew up and you were a little kid and you came across the Dharma, what would your immediate reaction be? Would it be, oh God, this is going to be really, really hard. Oh, really stressful. Maybe I'll wait. <laughs> or will it be, oh, that was the thing that really helped open me. Yay, yay, that, that, that. You know, what's our approach to the Dharma right now? Because that's a lot of what we're going to bring to our future life. When we meet Buddhist things, is it going to trigger delight and anticipation and joy and yearning? Or is it going to trigger a bit of like, heaviness and pressure and you know so it's really important to ask ourselves are we meeting our practice with a joyful mind if we're starting to think of it like a chore something needs to ease off or something needs to get more inspired something needs to shift um so don't like white knuckle it <laughs> right because that's not gonna come in handy the next time around keep a happy mind um and then there was a question in the chat, is there any relationship here with a healthy life? It might be worse to have a long-term dis uh, disabling illness such as Alzheimer's where it might be really challenging to practice. Do these practices help? Yeah, absolutely. This practice helps not just for long life, but for health. Yeah, you want a healthy long life, not just a generic long life or one filled with illness. Um, for things like Alzheimer's specifically and dementia, it's good to have Manjushri practice also. Uh, Manjushri particularly does help with memory. Um, for all forms of illness, Medicine Buddha, you know, but you don't have to overload yourself. Everything can work with one practice. It's just kind of knowing that um, if you've got a predisposition in your family, maybe focus on things that are going to clear that specific illness that you're worried that you, that you might have if you have a long life yeah yeah it's a good point because just living long doesn't guarantee practice for sure so in the longer version of the practice um you'll see circles of the mantra so not just the little center one which is the classic but um, you'll also see Nagarjuna's method for purifying the speech includes the same syllables as in the additional mantra garlands in the white Tara Chinna Chakra practice or wish fulfilling wheel practice. So those additional um, syllables are just adding more power and more purification. So just to make it really simple, you've got the main mantra in the center. And then you've got purifying body, purifying speech, purifying mind in concentric circles outward. And this is what I mean when this practice actually can get more elaborate than most um, lower tantra sadhanas, because here's what it looks like in color. And if you continue the practice, then you add this, these colored rings of light, which are layers of protection so peace increase power and wrath like we talked about with the 21 taras plus enlightened activity plus stability of actions and attainment so it's a lot right there's a lot happening there so in the middle you've got you know may life wisdom and merit increase and then may body be purified speech be purified mind be purified and then there's that vajra fence that larger blue circle. And then outside of that, you either think you as Tara, if you have the empowerment, or Tara above your crown, sends out rings of protection, protection light. And the first ring brings pacification or peacefulness in all of your inner and outer life. And that's um, the white ring, it's very skinny. Yeah, and then after the white ring is increased, which is that very skinny yellow ring. So increasing all of the blessings, all of the realizations. Then you have red. So that's power or magnification or magnetizing or controlling, but only from a positive perspective. So this is like good influence. Yeah, good influences. Then Roth is the dark blue. And so this is the appearance of fierceness 
but not at all angry. So when fierceness and strength are needed, you have protection to be able to have your mind do that without it going in an afflicted way. And also it's protection from negative influences coming from the outside. And then you have enlightened activity, which is represented by the green ring. So enlightened activity like regular green Tara, so swift action to swiftly bring about positive practice. And then the last layer is brown. Sometimes it's depicted as like hot pink. That last layer um, has different colors, but usually it's brown. It's brown in the sadhana. And that represents stability of the actions and attainments. So basically stabilizing everything else. So it's a lot going on. And if you have the empowerment, you're at the center as Tara with these from your heart radiating out. If you don't have the empowerment, it's from the Tara at your crown with those things radiating out. So that's interesting for those of you that maybe have done that longer version of the practice. Um, if you haven't, it's just interesting to know that there is, um, layers of visualization with white Tara that can be really very nurturing and stabilizing, especially if your outer life has a lot of chaos in it. You know, if especially if there's people who are really not being kind or who are actively aggressive towards you, or there are things in your life that are making your health harder, it can help with those conditions. Like say you live somewhere that's very polluted or you live somewhere where it's hard to get healthy food, like it's a long drive to the grocery store, or you know, there's just outer influences that make health hard. This can really help protect you from those negative influences and hold the vitality and strength of your practice to you. So that's a nice um, benefit of the longer practice. So I know that was a lot quickly, and this concept of peace, increase, power, and wrath, this concept, we talked about it briefly with the 21 Taras, that they're kind of grouped. The white ones are peace, and the yellow ones are increase, and the red ones are power, and the black ones are wrath. Um, generally speaking, that's a way to categorize the 21 Taras, but that framing of those four activities is something you're going to see repeated in Tantra all over the place. So they're kind of, they're called like the divine actions or ways of being that an enlightened being can kind of manifest in order to benefit sentient beings. So to make it ordinary, think of them as skill sets or tools. Yeah, you have the ability to pacify. That means you have the ability to bring harmony and subdue agitation, really smoothing things out. Yeah. The power of increase means whatever is there, you can help increase it. And it, there's a general feeling of abundance and resources. The control or the power one is like magnetizing influence that makes people excited about your good projects and want to support them, for example. Or when you have something important to say, you have the impact that you want to have. So it's all from a positive perspective, but I'm sure we've all had that experience where we have something important to say, no one cares, right? It would be nice to have magnetizing karma to be able to have our important statement land, be understood and responded to, right? And then very, very occasionally wrath is needed. And to have wrath in a way that is in no way going to harm anyone but is going to intimidate negative states of mind. Yeah, and the example I always think about with Roth is a little bit how a very, very skilled dog trainer can adopt a position of authority very quietly without shouting and just do a few small gestures towards the dog and it immediately subdues and like wags its tail and is like totally happy. Whereas if the trainer is angry, and fierce and yelling and hurts the dog, the dog might subdue, but it's gonna have fear and tension and rage and probably lash out later. So wrath is not to harm anyone or anything. It's a position of dominance and strength, but for the benefit of someone else to subdue their negative states of mind. And so it's very, very delicate to use and something that we really shouldn't think we're able to use until our anger is really, really under control. Yeah, because it's very easy for wrath to turn into anger. Yeah. 
So, um, see a question from the chat. Can we acquire these skill sets before the path of seeing in this lifetime? I think we can, we're starting to build them just with the practices themselves. Um, to have them fully realized, you need to be enlightened. But it's often the case during the empowerment where there'll be um, the stick drop. Can you picture the stick drop part of a long initiation? And it goes, you know, goes flunk, you know, and um, the Lama will say, oh, pacifying. Yeah, that usually is indicating that whoever dropped the stick and everyone that they are representing, when they do that practice, it's going to lead to that attainment more swiftly. So that's kind of, it's cool and interesting information. It's kind of like a prophecy in a way, like when you do this practice, it's going to have this particular power more quickly. So it'll have impact even before you're enlightened, but it won't be perfected until you're fully enlightened. Now, other questions before we have a stretch? Okay, a uh, five minute break. So I thought we would do the meditation that is good for people who are ill. So if, um, if you don't have anyone ill or unwell in your life that you want to do prayers for, we can just think that we're doing it for everyone in Ukraine or wherever. <laughs> yeah. So before we start, just kind of think to yourself, all right, who's someone that I really want to direct this healing energy, this life-giving energy to? And it can be a pet. Um, it could be someone who's not ill, but they're a little bit old, um, or just anybody in your life. Just take a minute and, and choose somebody. And think, may their long and healthy life result in deep spiritual practice. And may the karmic connection between us be positive and supportive for the spiritual path. And so visualize them. You can imagine them seated or laying down. But try and really imagine the person that you're doing this practice for the sort of clothes and colors they would normally wear, the way, or, the way their hair usually is, a neutral or pleasant expression on their face. And then visualize white Tara above them. Radiant white, three-dimensional, made of light, seated on a lotus, sun and moon, in the Vajra posture, covered in silks that float and hover an inch from her body. Her right hand down, her left hand at her heart, holding the stem of an Utpala flower. In the prime of radiant youth, full of vitality, with six eyes. The three on her face, having achieved the realization of the three doors of liberation. Emptiness, signlessness, wishlessness. Those on her hands and feet, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. So imagine her very present with this person you're doing the practice for.
You then visualize beams of white nectar entering the crown of their head, totally filling their body, purifying all their defilements and negative karmas, their sickness, and the threat of untimely death. And hold that awareness while adding the mantra. We'll do the White Tara Mantra 21 times, and you can continue with that, or I'll simplify to the regular Tara Mantra. Om Tare Yatu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyanjana Pushtam Kuri Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyanjana Pushtam Kuri Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyanjana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyanjana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Aya Punyan Jana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Aya Punyan Jana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Aya Punyan Jana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru So Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru So Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru So Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyajana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyanjana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyanjana Pushtam Kuru Soha Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mama Ayu Punyanjana Pushtam Kuru Soha Continuing the mantra under your breath, together with the beams of white nectar light entering their crown, filling their body, purifying their defilements, negative karma, sickness, and threat of untimely death.
Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Aya Punya Jana Pushtam Kuru Soha. Then when you finish the mantra recitation, really feel that their body is filled with white nectar light, like milk from white Tara, and envision they have achieved all of Tara's qualities, perfect power, the ability to benefit sentient beings, great compassion, and especially immortality. In other words, complete Buddhahood. Imagine those seeds, even though you're just a condition, never underestimate what a powerful condition we can be. And Tara dissolves into light and absorbs into them, stabilizing the blessing. And then we dedicate. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of our merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with the mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May we be a protector for those who need protection, a guide for those on the path, a boat, a raft, a bridge, for those who wish to cross the flood. May we be a lamp in the darkness, a resting place for the weary, a healing medicine for all who are sick, and for the boundless multitudes of living beings, may we bring sustenance and awakening, enduring like the earth and sky, until all beings are freed from sorrow and all are awakened. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may we too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Remembering emptiness. Okay, so you can relax your attention. So we'll be doing a Tara practice as a retreat, not this weekend, but the next weekend. So if anybody is local, you're very welcome to come. And um, if you're not local, you're very welcome to come online. So all those details are on the Vajrapani website. It'll be half green Tara, half white Tara. So um, similar to our wisdom and compassion retreat where it was half, half uh, Chen Rezig, half Manjushri. And um, that Compassion and Wisdom Retreat is pretty much all uploaded onto YouTube now. So if you wanted any of those sessions, again, they're all available for free. Um, do you have any any questions or thoughts? This is this is not necessarily on topic, but it's something that I've been, I'll ask you and if you can answer it, I'd be grateful. So I, um, for a long, long time, most of my time with Dharma was spent in sadhanas and studying dharma and then it changed and now a, a lot of my time is in supporting the center and mm. in in working with a lot of people <laughs> and some not so easy to work with including me so so i'm kind of wondering like you know like milarepa i think a milarepa you know by practice so what's this like you know practicing dharma studying dharma you know what's what's the difference and they're both part of the path and can you talk to a little bit about that 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's all practice if you make it practice, and it's not necessarily practice just because it looks like it. Okay, so it's like the sadhana could just be, you know, reciting nice words without connecting to them, or it could be connecting deeply to them. So, you know, sadhana practice isn't necessarily practice unless you're deeply engaged and, you know, really connecting with it. Service can be the best practice there is in terms of purifying the mind, in terms of generating huge amounts of merit, but only if you don't live on the surface of it and get swept up in the chaos of the everyday hustle and bustle. You have to choose to make it practice. So it's it's either way, it's all to the good if you decide to make it so. And I think sometimes when we're in the position of having to offer service and we have less time on our cushion, we could start to um, look down on service like it's not as important as the work that we do on the cushion. But it's not an either or, you know, it's it's kind of like the more you're out in the world and engaging with people and all of their drama and all of your drama and all of your, you know, expectations and, you know, all of the things that are disappointing about other people, um, it really shows you where the gaps in your practice are. So then when you go back to your cushion, you know what to emphasize, you know, so it's, it's a huge gift to be thrust in amongst people again, if you've not had such a busy life for a while, it's just also aggravating because you probably miss your peace. But actually, yeah. it could be the very thing that yeah. gives you new life for your practice. So, you know, I personally, I feel like life goes in chapters, you know, sort of study, meditate, offer service, study, meditate, offer service. And all chapters have all of those, but a different one is emphasized, you know, so it's kind of like I'm in a, a service chapter of my life. My service is teaching and helping Dharma centers, you know, I don't want that to be the continuous chapter forever. I might have some retreat emphasis more and then teaching less. I might go back to studying more and then teaching meditating less, you know, but all three are enriching the practice. And I think it's really understanding pacing. And I think it's important to never feel like your life is taking you away from your practice. Your life is your practice. And if for some, yeah, and if for some reason, the things in your life are too hard to take on the path, then something's got to give and life needs to change. But, you know, that's a rare case, pretty much anything can be taken on the path to transformation. And uh, there's the classic quote that gets quoted at Dharma centers all the time for people who are offering service, which is apparently from Lama Zopa Rinpoche, where he apparently said that offering service for a Dharma center for one year is the same amount of merit and purification as doing a three-year retreat, because <laughs> it's so much uh, harder. Yeah, I <laughs> so much yeah harder. that makes sense totally. <laughs> And Just working in general, but yeah, working for Dharma Center, because you all have such incredibly strong karmic connection with each other, good and bad over countless lifetimes. It's kind of like volatile in a way that you don't expect from nice, friendly people who are practicing. You're like, these are all Dharma people. Why are they so? I know. Right, I know. know. <laughs> That's what I think. I thought they were going to be better. I thought it was going to all be better. And it's all like a fire. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Totally. And, and it's remembering too that if you're with other people who are practicing, we have so much pride and we have so much ego, and then we have so much like self loathing and so much defensiveness that if we're also on a spiritual path, then that's going to get all tangled in with it. And we're going to start feeling like we're not living up to our ideals. And then if we're around other people with those ideals, that they're going to notice. And so it makes you defensive and it makes you demanding and it makes you unbearable to be around. And, you know, this is what happens in all religious communities, not just Buddhist ones, where oh. the ideals themselves put a kind of pressure on you to perform or live up to it if your pride is at all engaged. So sometimes, you know, if you were just working for a regular nonprofit, it'd be a lot easier and friendlier. Or if you were just like working at McDonald's, you'd all have a great time, just laugh and muck about. But it's a, a Dharma center. So it's like, there's this extra pressure to be something or to do something in amongst your service. And that can actually bring out the worst in people. So I think that if you're aware that people have their beautiful Dharma practice and then they have all of their feelings of not living up to it. And that either 
triggers some sort of aggressiveness or some sort of depression or all that can trigger all sorts of weird stuff when they're with other dharma people it'll make you softer with them you know and gentler with them and more patient with them because you know that they're struggling against their own best intentions and hating that they don't live up to them yeah. does, does it make sense well listening to you helps me understand a lot of the dynamics I currently experience, not only with other people, but myself. Sometimes the worst things in me come out and I go like, I, I don't do that in other places with other people. Why am I doing it with my Dharma sisters and brothers? I'm like, this is like, they yeah. said, someone said, when you step in the guru's mandala, everything heats up. And it does sort of feel like that which is the opposite. I thought it was going to be peaceful. And <laughs> like, oh, I'm like, work. The, storm. <laughs> I'm like, the opposite. I mean, it's worse, but that makes the sense, right? What? I mean, it's, it's worse than you expected it to be, but actually that makes the practice better if you can keep your sense of humor and you can keep objectivity, you know, and detached, not disengaged, right? Like, uh, offering service to a Dharma center is one of the most profoundly powerful things you can do. It's one of the best things that you can do karmically. And it is so fraught. So if you can really think this is an amazing rare chance to practice and to offer service to sentient beings and to create the cause to meet the teachings again and again and again, it's am amazing how precious it is. And all of your stuff's going to come up it's almost like a healing crisis. Like you've stepped into this purifying environment and now all of your like latent yeah. crap is just coming out where it was just yeah. sitting quietly before and not yeah, causing yeah, that's right. that's it. Right. It was just sitting. It was like you were perfectly right. polite a minute ago. Yeah. Like where'd that come from? Like, whoa, right. I thought I was done with that. No. You'll get unexpected illness or you'll get unexpected weird. Yeah. Anyway, weird stuff happens. So keep your sense of humor, keep objectivity. And I'm going to um, listen to this enjoy. talk again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, then in the chat is offering service to an abbey or monastery as or a, much more powerful than offering service to a Dharma center. It, it depends on the, you know, collection of people that you're offering service to. So theoretically offering service to people with more vows is more merit, um, theoretically. But lots of people at Dharma centers have bodhisattva vows and tantric vows, even if they don't have monastic vows. So you know, I think offering service is great. Just do it where it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And don't overthink who it is you're offering service to. If it's for the Dharma, it's amazing. Yeah. Because it's like um, Lama Zopa always saying, like, it's like Dharma centers are a hospital for the mind. And we're all really a bit unwell. <laughs> Even if we're totally functional and relatively happy, we're also a bit unwell. And so these Dharma centers are so precious. And you notice in the degenerate age, it's harder to keep them going. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of people power. So anyway, I'm rejoicing and um, be patient with yourself. <laughs> be patient with other sentient beings. They're going to be troublemakers. Bless them. And thank you all for your service. I know quite a few of you offer service to Dharma centers. Thank you so much, you guys. Really amazing. Yep. Okay, well, I'll see you on uh, Tuesday. Have a good night.